Thank you, Mr. Calvert. Thank you. Um, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, you know, we all get behind these microphones on occasion and we want to share something. And tonight I'm going to try to stay on a theme. I'm going to try to walk through one of my intense frustrations around here that we keep making public policy as, as let's be honest, we just passed the Democrats, not, I don't think a single Republican voted for it, a $350 billion bill that originally was labeled as Competes Act. But if you look at the math in it and the spending in it, it's functionally, hey, let's give lots of money to our special interests who actually support them politically. So here's the theme. If I came to any member of Congress, any one of our staff, anyone out there listening in the public and said, what makes people poor? Seriously, what makes our brothers and sisters who are working poor, poor, and you get these discussions, oh, we don't tax rich people enough and transfer their wealth, or we don't do this, or we don't do that, and turns out, when you actually look at the math, almost none of those things are actually true. It's complicated. So we've been doing a project for almost a year in our office of trying to understand what's different. Well, so we held a hearing you know, recently on health disparities. Guess what? It's, there really are health disparities between certain urban minority populations, my tribal communities in the Southwest, but why? Hey, also take a look, there's crime. Crime differential, when someone steals your stuff or breaks your bones, you're not able to go to work, you're not able to gain, accumulate. You actually start to look at all these things that are societal factors. You open up the border, you're competing against others with similar skill sets, labor sets. And my argument is over this last 12 months of unified leftist, unified Democrat control of government, we're just crushing people. We're crushing the working poor, we're crushing the middle class, and the data, and I'm gonna prove it. But one of the most interesting things we've been looking at, and we've actually taken some ridicule for fixating on this, but the math is the math. I would typically start these presentations with take a look at the accumulation of US sovereign debt. It is exploding. 29 years, $112 trillion, and that's based on last year's CBO math. It's Social Security and Medicare, primarily Medicare, but 31% of Medicare spending and borrowing is just diabetes. Well, also that other project we've been doing of what makes certain populations poor? Well, it turns out our brothers and sisters who are often working poor or just trying to survive have dramatically higher health problems, and it's primarily diabetes in, in, in rural poverty, in my tribal poverty, in my urban poverty. Look at the diabetic numbers. So wouldn't the most compassionate thing be not do what the left keeps saying of, we're gonna build more clinics, help people live with their misery, but how about doing something revolutionary? How about curing how about investing in curing our brothers and sisters who suffer? And we're working, and it's hard, it's difficult math, but what would happen if a cure to income inequality? Well, then you'd have to eventually adjust for crime and open borders and all the other things that we're going to talk about. And we've taken some ridicule saying, well, type 1, type 2 diabetes, you can't. Well, it turns out, We've been tracking the science. And there was a time we used to have this constant debate here where Democrats would accuse Republicans of not following the science. And we're obviously, when particularly with COVID, you know, accusing the Democrats. But does anyone actually here have a alert on their search engines to track the news stories of some of the really amazing stuff happening? So this is a story functionally from yesterday. And it's a unique approach they're functionally doing a uh, CRISPR altered stem cell. And the beauty of that is what happens if I can get your body 
to start producing insulin again, and you're, because we know type 1 diabetes and part of type 2 is an autoimmune reaction. Your body is killing the cells that produce insulin. And so with that little bit of CRISPR technology, your body doesn't recognize it and doesn't kill the very cell that's producing the um, ability to take on your glucose. It's begun. It's actually moved into type 1. So think of this. We just spent $350 billion, well, at least the Democrats are trying to. And something like this, if you'd done a version of Operation Warp Speed, or call it whatever you want if, if that's too Trumpian for the left, but the single biggest driver of U.S. debt is diabetes. 33% of all healthcare spending, 31% of Medicare spending. You would think that this place would be almost giddy. Now, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe ultimately, but the ability to say, we're going to do something that's noble, compassionate, loving, and cure the misery instead of keeping populations sort of trapped in their misery because they're beholden to one political party's largesse. It's beginning. This is the type of disruption. This is symbolic of the type of disruption that makes the country wealthier, more prosperous, and minimizes misery. And we've been talking about this technology coming for about a year and why we're not doing more investing in it. So the White House has a initiative, wonderful. But they need to redesign, and the same thing here in the House, we need to redesign where the resources of primary research or the incentive to bring a product to market or the timing it takes to make it through the math of a phase one, phase two, phase three. We do it the wrong way. Just as the Democrats' bill they just passed where it's command and control, it's almost the five-year plan, um, federal government will decide who gets a grant, who doesn't get a grant, you now have to come be really nice to the administration and your member of Congress if you want money for your business. The arrogance of this place. One, one of the hazards of members of Congress, it's like that running joke, what are the two times in life you think you know everything? When you're 13 years old and the day after you get elected to Congress. The debate here so often sounds like it's a decade out of date. But think about the board I was just showing. If there really is, and it's now in type one, or, or excuse me, phase one trial, an ability to make a to cure type one and make a dramatic difference in type two, to understand what that means for the financials of the country and the world, what that actually means for health and misery, but also what it potentially means for populations that we talk about constantly, we virtue signal constantly, but we don't actually do something in raising their living standard, raising their economics, closing income inequality. And instead, we're, we're in a body right now with unified Democrat control where the solution is send someone a check. Well, the sending someone a check doesn't end the misery. Disruptive technology like this that cures the misery is what we should be almost evangelizing here. And I know that's hard. So let's talk about some of the other things that make the working class poorer. The working poor substantially poorer. We saw, and I know there's been many members here have come and talked about inflation, um, but, but I don't think we've understood the misery it ultimately brings, and it's, a, it's, it's the slow type of misery, because every time you go to the grocery store, that piece of protein you wanted, or that milk, or something else gets a little bit more expensive. Your paycheck may have gone up, but somehow everything you're buying goes up more. And we're going to walk through a couple boards here just showing the fact of the matter under Democrat unified control of government, our society's actually gotten poorer even though we have pumped stunning amounts of money of cash into the society, and we're going to sort of show that. So understand, we all saw the number at the end of the year, 
you know, 7% inflation. In my home, you know, I'm from the Phoenix area, we were approaching 9%. A lot of that driven by housing. Imagine what that index did to homelessness. Um, we're going to see some statistics here of the narcotics and other things that have been coming across the border now that we have sort of an open border policy from the left. And instead, I'd like us to talk about the economics and the misery such policies have brought and how it all ties together. So let's go back a little more on inflation. You think about inflation, how many times have you heard our brothers and sisters on the left get behind their microphones and talk about it's increasing inequality. So I thought that was the holy grail here. Close inequality, but yet their policies keep growing it. We're seeing some numbers here where about $3,500 of additional spread of inequality driven by a single year's worth of policies that drove up inflation. And the solution from the left is, well, we're going to send them another check even though the check is actually what substantially drove creating inflation. Remember, basic economics. Remember your elementary school and your high school economic class. What is inflation? It's too many dollars chasing too few goods and services. Real simple. I mean, the real world's actually a little more complicated, but that's the classic. So you have two things. You can keep jacking up interest rates to squeeze out the liquidity of dollars chasing those goods, or, or and, or plus, you can do the other side, like we did in 1981. They raised interest rates, but people forget the first year of President Reagan, even with a Democrat Congress, they adopted tax cuts and policies to make more stuff. If you have lots of dollars out there chasing things, you've got a couple solutions. You could squeeze the dollars out of the economy to lower inflation, or you can make more stuff. Because too many dollars chasing not enough goods. OK, make more stuff. It's a classic supply-side solution. Make the tax code, the regulatory code, the incentives to make more stuff. Instead, we just passed a $350 billion bill that functionally puts government in charge of grants and control and what they want, instead of the information part of the market where resources, where the ability to act quickly. We should be incentivizing the animal spirits to go make more stuff as a way to lower this inflation that's crushing people. And it's a much more elegant way because it creates jobs, it creates products. But for some reason, the left is almost maniacal in a Keynesian view of the world saying, well, do lots of stimulus. And yet, they seem unwilling to even accept the data produced by their side that says they've raised the misery of so many Americans. And, and understand that the math at the end of the year was pretty simple. Inflation went up, people's wages went up, but there's a gap, and the gap keeps growing. And that gap is the fact you got poorer last year. But this is the one that I'm still just shocked there's not more discussion about. If you see the percentage of monthly change in real wages, remember, you may get your paycheck. Your paycheck may go up, but if your rent, your fuel, your food, everything else in your life went up more, you see how many months people got poorer. Yet, you look at the way we're doing policy here, it's the administration, my Democrat colleagues, willingness to continue to spend money at just stunning levels in ways that the economics say you're going to actually make people poorer. Planned economy hasn't worked particularly well anywhere in the world. And you start to see the data of the gap. And we've tried to present this in, in not a mean way, but the fact of the matter is the Democrat policies, since, you remember, they, they took over Congress, what, three years ago. They now have unified government after the last election. The gap between 
the wealthy and the poor, is growing. Do you all remember 2018, 2019? The vicious rhetoric that came from our brothers and sisters on the left after we did tax reform. Yet, in modern economic times, it was the greatest success we've had in shrinking income inequality. You're going to see some boards here where food insecurity, it worked. Our brothers and sisters on the lower courthouse, and I always hate that term, but the fact of the matter, they became dramatically less poor. And then when the Democrats take power, they abandon the very things that were working. And their policies, I mean, at some point you've got to admit, you've got to admit to, to everyone, because we're feeling and seeing it. You've made the rich richer, you've made the poor poorer, and you've increased the misery. You know, we all know the sayings of, 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 of when something isn't working, stop it, take a breath, take a look at what was, was working. But it turns out the ideological calcification that is Congress now is more important to that dogma than what actually works. So we sort of walk through these. And I know this seems like a lot, but, but you keep trying to, to make the point over and over and that the data is factual. It's not just information by virtue signaling. The data is the data is the data. Is you come here, and, and this is my comment from the quartiles. So these are our brothers and sisters, we'll call it in the lower 20%. Well, how much of their income goes to housing, transportation, food? Now you notice, these numbers are off the charts. That's because they receive also subsidies. You know, um, earned income tax credit. These other things we do to try to make their lives less miserable. But somewhere here, this body forgot that if you are poor, I mean truly poor, that bottom 20% quartile, the majority of your income just goes to try to do housing. And what did the Democrats accomplish this last year? We blew up the price of rents. And go back, there were speeches from a number of us from one, two years ago, talking about saying, you need to create the safety net, you need to create a bottom so the economy snaps back, but be careful because when you create too much liquidity, government spending, you're going to blow up the cost of everything for people. It happened. And what's the solution? The left now talks about doing another stimulus bill to make these people's lives even more miserable. Now, Maybe it's the arrogance of, hey, you know, these folks in the poorer quartiles, they've been indoctrinated. They're going to vote for the left. So just abuse the crap out of them. They're still going to vote for you. And the fact of the matter is, if you actually look at the real data of who votes for the Democrats anymore, it's urban elite. That's who finances their, their campaigns. It's no longer you know, the working men and women, um, they have migrated much more to the Republican side. So, so maybe what I'm seeing is politically logical, but economically, it's brutal. I mean, it, it, the math is the math, and at some point, the math, behind the math, are people who are suffering. So, think about this. If you just saw on the chart where the lowest couple quartiles spend most of their money just trying to do housing. Take a look what we've done to the housing prices. And this is mostly rent. You know, when you're in that bottom third, you're a renter. How many people right now who are renting, we now are responsible for economic policies, liquidity of cash, where we've blown up the cost of housing, blown up the cost of rents, that we now will have trapped so much of America into being permanent renters the rest of their lives. They're never going to build that sort of forced savings account that owning a house is, that became part of being able to retire, you know, as part of the American dream. But the math is the math. I mean, you look at African Americans, Latino populations, and the amount that has moved into struggling just to cover the rent, it's, it's blown up dramatically. And this just doesn't disappear. You don't wake up tomorrow and say, hey, 
we decided we're going to do economic policies, regulatory policies, tax policies, so we make a lot more stuff. Yes, the Federal Reserve pulls some liquidity out. We fixed inflation. Oh, isn't it neat? All the rents went back down. It doesn't work that way. So how long before these populations get their incomes back where they can actually survive, where the, just the cost of having a place to live isn't consuming almost every dollar of their lives? We don't talk enough about the policies here and the misery they've created. Yet, we have pumped so much cash into the system that we take a look at state and local, they're sitting on boatloads of cash. But there's also another really interesting trend line here. How did this happen? You know, we had these speeches here a year ago, year and a half ago, the world's coming apart, the world's falling apart, but yet somehow state and local tax receipts actually held up dramatically well. We overshot the mark, and then what did we do? Even though we knew they, they were doing just fine, the actual fall in receipts, which is the proper term for tax collections, was marginal. What did the Democrat policy do? Well, let's send them more cash, because that's their constituencies. So I want to walk through some of the other aspects that we believe left policies are making the working poor, the middle class poor. And, and here's a simple um, concept, and I've said it over and over, but, but you've got to understand, it's this layering effect. <sighs> Let's say you're that individual who didn't graduate high school. Um, and the value you bring to, to work is your willingness to work. So you're the person out there hanging drywall. Um, you're doing labor, you're doing landscaping, your, your goal is one day you hope to own the landscaping company, you hope to own the plaster company. You're out, but, but what you sell is your labor and your willingness to work. What are the two ways you crush that population economically? Inflation, we just did the inflation, you saw how much of their income now is going to just surviving. The second thing you do is you make them compete against millions of others with similar skill sets. So there's this great economic argument that if you want to grow American GDP, immigration is a big deal, but it has to be immigration that has a multiplier effect on everything from tax receipts to you know, the, the productivity, and you don't import massive poverty. It's uncomfortable to talk about it this way, but the fact of the matter is, being a border state, what is happening at our border? You're not bringing folks who grow the economy the data says you're actually, what you're doing is you're making the working poor poor. And I don't know how often anyone here will get and talk about our crisis at the border, which is real. Come to Arizona. Go to Texas. But the societal impact of when you do it this way. And, and, and look, we could get into some of the really interesting economic data saying, hey, when populations leave this country, you just actually wiped out the ambitious populations because these are people willing to pack up and leave and you actually hurt the um, departing country. But the fact of the matter is you also hurt the folks here. It, it, and the numbers at the border are just stunning. I mean, when you start thinking of during this administration, a couple million folks, they may be wonderful people, it's not about them. It's the impact of the very people we claim we care about. We claim we're trying to help. We're tr we claim we're trying to close income inequality. We claim we're trying to make the poor less poor. And then we do everything we can to crush them. And it's just the economics. It's the, I just can't figure out what the left is doing intellectually. They know this numbers. If it was a decade, 10, 15 years ago, all the literature we keep finding, it was Democrats here who were fixated on locking down the border because they knew it hurt the poor and the working poor. It was, they used to accuse Republicans of wanting open borders to push down labor values. Do you remember? It wasn't that long ago the argument was flipped. And there goes my theory that maybe the left truly has abandoned working men and women in this country because they no longer are their defenders. 
then now almost the defenders of someone who needs a cheap landscaper. And the border numbers are real. I mean, when you start seeing data coming from the administration itself, and they make it really hard to find the actual facts, but when you're seeing numbers that are 278% increases, and you start to realize, what's this going to mean? So there's a great paper. Um, we came here and talked about it a few months ago, and it's a decade-old paper. And it was talking about what happens when you get these waves of illegal crossing and they get rolled into your economy. And it was talking that it would take a decade for that lower quartiles, the, 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 the poor middle class, the working poor, for their incomes to start to come up. And it was solely a division of um, number of people with similar skill sets divided by the uh, uh, attacking the same types of positions and work. And it was a Democrat paper. I mean, it was written by folks who made it very clear they were on the left. Isn't it fascinating uh, how quickly the understanding of demographics and the population dynamics and what it does to the very people that our friends on that side used to say they cared about? And, I, and look, we do lots of virtue signaling here, with, you know, lots of pretty words, lots, but, but the data is the data is the data, the policies are the policies. The policies are killing the middle class, they're killing the working poor. And you start to look at these things, and here's the great irony. So think of this. During this last year, last two years, legal visas have collapsed. At the same time, you have these huge runs at our border. Now, I know this is often, a, and, and it probably requires a much more deep dive on economic multipliers of certain types of skill sets and those things. But the fact of the matter is, these populations up here, we know we get an economic multiplier from. These populations over here, it's uncomfortable, but it's the math. It becomes a contribution from society to them. Um, and we did a presentation about a year ago talking about that if you saw what was happening in the entire industrialized world, remember the only place in the world right now with positive fertility rates is sub-Saharan Africa. And I know this is geeky, but it's important. And I know it's not politics by shiny object, which is now what Congress is about. But this is important. The Western world is collapsing demographically and fertility-wise. The primary, dr the, the driver of U.S. sovereign debt is our demographics. We're getting older. Somehow Congress didn't figure out there were baby boomers until the last year or two, and now they still don't want, really want to talk about it. So for 65 years, they just didn't know we were coming. But what happens when you even see data of China's demographics are collapsing. Um, Europe's, we are, known has been collapsing. Even countries like India, we're seeing their fertility rates fall off rather dramatically. The model basically says in the coming two, three decades, it won't be worldwide fights over hydrocarbons like we had functioning in the 70s. Or rare earths. Remember how many people would come behind these mics just you know, a couple of years ago? Rare earths, we're all going to go to war over rare earths. Turns out now that we know how to do the iron air battery and all these other things, the rare earth consumption looks like we may have been really, there may be a path around the, the massive needs. It turns out over the next couple decades, it's going to be the battle for smart people. And that's a really interesting thing to think about. So we do the brilliant thing with unified leftist government. We make sure that legal visas, legal immigration crashes, but we open up our border to bring in more poverty and misery to even our own poor. It just, you can't, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's just like every policy set has great headlines, great you know, talking points, acting like you're caring, and you're completely avoiding the misery Democrat policies keep bringing to the society. I mean,
And then well, we, there's the things we call sort of second degree, third degree effects when you open up the border. Come to my community of Phoenix. See the dramatic increase in homelessness. Does anyone else out there care? To see, and, and, and I did a ride along a couple weeks ago with a neighbor who's an officer, and, and we spent you know, four or five hours driving around, and he's been doing this like 28 years, and he's telling me he's never ever seen that, that, that the homeless population has doubled. The crime, people breaking in and stealing stuff, but they're stealing stuff from other poor people. The violence. And then we start to see the data of my southern border in Arizona, the amount of narcotics. And, and one of the classic, if you want to play economist, the price of drugs that are killing people have crashed. When you see the narcotics fall in price, what does that tell you? There's a hell of a lot of them. So, okay, maybe it's leftist orthodoxy, you need an open border, but did they have to flood my neighborhoods with narcotics? Did they have to spike the homelessness around the country, particularly in Phoenix? Did you have to make more people's lives miserable? Because that's what the policies of this administration and the Democrat control of this place have done. And I don't think they meant to do it. It was obvious if they thought like an economist instead of virtue signaling for policy. Remember, we make policy now around here by feelings, by what we can say behind these microphones to get someone to send us money, even if it's crap and really hurts people. And you start to see the misery the Democrat policies have put on our streets. And of course, their solution will be, well, we're going to send them a check. Of course, the check will also continue the cycle of inflation, making people poor. You know, it's just, I, I almost wish we could have, where there's no television cameras, no mics, put ourselves in a room with a couple of people that own calculators and say, let's walk through what has worked in the last 25 years and the things that haven't worked. Madam Speaker, what's my time? The gentleman has 25 minutes remaining. Madam Speaker, could you repeat? 25 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And then, when you're done doing your ride along with the Phoenix City policeman, who's, who's just, and, he, and he's heartbroken. He's actually even moved out of the very neighborhood he loved that he's patrolled, because even he thinks the property crime, the violent crime, the people living in the alleys has become too much for even he and his wife. But the other thing you talked about is how many overdose deaths. How many people... Now, we, we need to accept a lot of this is a combination of COVID policy, economic policy. We're hunting for the 2021 number. But... Everything we've gotten so far, we've created misery out there. Go pick up your community newspaper, and do they even still talk about how many have died from overdoses, or has it just become so commonplace it's not worth reporting on that type of misery anymore? And then you start to look at the crime statistics. And look, Democrats often accuse Republicans of talking about crime to scare people. That's not where I'm at. My district is an urban, suburban district. I care about these lives, but, but I also am fascinated by the economics of it. Well, it turns out we did inflation, we did housing, we did the devaluing of people's labor by opening up the border, but we almost never have the conversation of how do you move out of poverty 
when people keep stealing your stuff. I, I, I have, I'll call him an acquaintance. He's almost a friend. Uh, as a kid, I used to hang drywall. He still has the drywall business. Um, now he's passed it on to his kids and his grandkids. Um, and they're really good. They can do a, a, a number five smooth coat, un, unlike, and that's always been my dream to learn how to do that the right way. It's, it's a weird hobby. And he talks about they are now not doing projects in certain areas because people keep stealing their stuff. And it's really hard to keep people employed. It's really hard to be that micro entrepreneur where you're selling your talent and your talent is functioning, your willingness to show up and the fact you have a couple drywall spades. So we're also working on a project now in our office to try to understand how much of income inequality, people being poor, is the fact that they live in a crime-ridden area, crime-ridden zip code, where people keep breaking their bones and stealing their stuff, and by stealing their stuff, they can't accumulate assets, and how much of that stuff was the very things they need for work. And then you overlay just the incredible spike of deaths or murders that are happening in parts of the country. Now, may maybe this is a societal reaction to locking up parts of the populations, um, you know, idleness. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not a sociologist. But we have to understand so many of our urban areas across the country, there's misery. But there's, but there's hope. If we could get our policy sets correct around here, there's incredible hope because we do have a society that desperately, an economy that desperately, a country that desperately needs people. They need workers. You see the workforce shortage continues, even with today's numbers, and, and we need to talk a little, I'll, I'll do this, this might be a weird transition. Really good unemployment numbers today. Even though unemployment actually went up as a percentage, but the number of jobs, which that's a good sign, uh, people being willing to take the jobs, be a little careful. We need to re-take a look at what they call the labor force participation number, because it's been re-indexed. Every year you actually try to do a calculation. We haven't had a chance to look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics underlying numbers. So there was this beautiful spike in labor force participation. We need to figure out how much of that, though, is they changed the numbers of the population that's available to be in the labor force, but today was a good number. But the wage inflation number was really dangerous because we have talked about that one of our models we have in joint economic is that if we spike much more, you're on the cusp of a wage price spiral. And that's just a great way to create misery in the society because it's really, those are really hard to break. And once again, we were doing in 2018, 2019, I, I believe much of it came because we fixed some great inequities in our tax code. Um, but something, if you start to look at the data, why in this last year has there been this massive, a million and a half more retirees than we ever, than we ever modeled for? Why are so many people basically saying, screw this, I'm out of the labor markets, I'm disappearing? At the very time that if we were actually doing policy where you wanted to deal with the debt, you wanted to be able to keep having enough receipts, tax revenues, to be able to keep our commitments on Social Security and Medicare. If you wanted to lower the misery in the country, you'd be doing policies that would be trying to get young males into the workforce. There's a weird number there where they're not showing up in the workforce, but also folks who are eligible for retirement, early retirement, to stay in the workforce. Those are policies that I, I think Republicans and Democrats could agree upon, labor and business could agree upon, and yet I sometimes feel really lonely around here talking about these things, because, but it's the math. And you see these numbers of, you know, when you're losing a million and a half folks that are choosing to, to retire early, 
you do realize the data basically says a large portion of these people in a few years, particularly if inflation continues the next couple of years, will be in poverty. One of the greatest ways to minimize poverty for folks in their retirement years is to have them delay retirement. Something's perverse out there when we have created a society that's incentivized to go take your Social Security at 62 and take the shortfall, or the, the cuts, the, the, the lower premiums or, or lower benefit. I'm just really concerned about this. And then you start to take a look at other population dynamics. And, and this goes back to my earlier statement that I believe in this coming decade, actually the decade we're in and the next one, the fight for smart people will be akin to the pursuit of rare earths or hydrocarbons or those things from the past. And you see it. This is happening all around us. There is a collapse in the demographics. It's, you know, this is China, US, Europe, and it's for all of us. We're less bad than some of the others, but it's miserable. And it's the great opportunity to say, if we would fix the tax code. And yes, maybe it's time to look at the border adjustability so we stop having the arbitrage or when we try to sell things, there's this massive tax arbitrage of manufactured goods from the United States. But this is our reality. And yet, this place will live on being enraged over the next mask mandate, or this or that. Those are big deals. But they're not what's going to wipe out this republic, being unwilling to deal with the fact of our math. And so think about this. We should be ashamed. And Republicans have part of this, too, as part of our sin. A small part, but part of it. We've been trying to do the math. Take a guess how much money we handed out per family in COVID aid. You know, I mean, it, it, it's out there. So think of this. I just showed you a bunch of slides saying working men and women have gotten poorer in the last year, but the debt exploded in the last two years. And now we're doing the math saying, do you realize we put out over $76,000 per household in cash? That was COVID cash? Seventy-six, over $76,000. That, that's our best math at this point. And we've been having to go up and down different budget reports. And, but do you feel, any, any of our, anyone here in this room or around the country, do you feel you got $76,000 worth of value the last 18 months? But that's what we spent. And that's what we tacked on to my little girl's bonds that she gets to pay for. Maybe the concept of throwing more and more cash and blowing up inflation and destroying the incentive to work and, 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 and delinking society from the nobility of work. Oh, by the way, that work actually makes them much less poor. And now you actually start to see that over the last couple of years, it made more sense not to participate in society. This is what we did. Maybe they weren't thinking, maybe they didn't mean to, but this is what we did. So we've de-linked, we functionally financed staying home. And then the last little perversity of just from today. So you'll hear many of the left try to tout that $350 billion bill they just passed here in the House. And if you dig through it, it's like, you know, a five-year plan, government, you know, planned economy. I mean, it really is sort of terrifying. But there's a little gem stuck in the left's bill they just passed. Do you realize in there you have the pandemic inning in 2025? It's not based on, hey, we have antivirals now. Hey, we have vaccines now. Hey, we have... We know how we now have home PCR or test. We have all the things we said we needed. They're here. But instead, we're going to keep the pandemic going. That's what you all just voted on till 2025. 
in my argument, it's about the money. The pandemic declaration has become a conduit to hand out cash, hand out cash to your favorite groups to make uh, corporate America hospitals other addicted to the Democrat Party because they're handing out cash. And now we just passed a piece of legislation that says the pandemic ends in 2025. I beg someone out there, please listen. Turn course on the policies. Come up with a unified theory that, that moves prosperity. Because economic growth, prosperity is moral. But almost every act moved by the Democrats this year, almost every initiative from this White House has made America poor, has made America more dangerous, and now they're passing pieces of legislation to make sure we stay in this sort of dystopian chaos for years more. Take a breath, look at the data, look at the misery this place has created over the last year. And seriously, I beg of you, consider having some self-awareness and some reflection and stop it. And with that, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 4th, 2021, the Chair.